if he couldn't handle it, he would not always look for a new challenge. I think that's what he likes, that's what he loves, to be manager and to have this in a daily work, that, that's him. The mental part in sport, it's, it's much bigger than you think. I mean, you know it's big, but yeah. it's huge. Now we're talking about the color of our away jersey, you know. We're having themes also at the last World Cup, which are not helping the team to be successful. This is up front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So on this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up under proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way, but more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, one of the greats of German football. Born in a time of upheaval and division, he went on to achieve 98 caps for his country, reaching major finals in the World Cup and the Euros. A multiple Bundesliga winner with Bayern Munich before mirroring trophy success here on these shores at Chelsea. Michael Ballack, welcome to Upfront. Michael, nice to see you in that beautiful background you've got there. Hello. Listen, Michael, when we're, when we're talking to you guys, we start by establishing a little bit about your background because yours is quite unique. I mean, I don't think there's many footballers or athletes that I've spoken to that have come from a background where you've been in a divided country where ultimately you've got two parts of the same country. You're an East German that ultimately ends up at 13 years of age. The Berlin Wall comes down and you find yourself in a united Germany. But I wanted to ask you what that was like for you as a background, because it feels to me, and maybe it's ignorance on my part, that it could be a little a bit of a case of the haves against the have-nots in terms of East Germany having a certain societal background and West Germany having another. What was that like for you? Yeah, as you described, I was, I was very young. Um, uh, with the age of 13, as you can imagine, you're not... Not even a teenager, really. It's more like a young boy. And um, I have to say, and I, I have to remember, I had a, ver a very good childhood, you know. Everything mm -hmm. was was well organized. Um, we had a very good education, good school system. And I went to a sports school because sports was obviously main part in East Germany, uh, where the focus was on. So for many kind of sports, um, and as a football player, who, somebody who loves football, I, I was good enough to join a sports school um, where, yeah, the, the combination of um, um, learning and uh, going to school, but also an, at the same time uh, having a, an education in, in sport was, was really good, organized and shared. So, for example, I went three, three hours to school, two hours training, another three hours at school and, and another two hours of training. So this was a really good uh, fundament I, I, I could achieve at this time. And um, yeah, from that on, I, yeah, I built and and I grow because your, fa your father was a footballer, wasn't he? Yes, but um, just until the age of seventeen, eighteen, then uh, he decided uh, to uh, to follow an academic part. He went to the university, stopped playing on on a high level. So uh, that's why actually I, I moved from my hometown Görlitz to to Karl Markstadt. Came uh, the name is Chemnitz today. Uh, yeah, because of 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 a job wise. Did he, did he put? Did he push you in the direction of sport, Michael? Was it? No, was no, it, no, no, not at all. I want. Uh, I was from the beginning. I loved football, you know, um, and uh, I went out every day. Um, the the social background was these, yeah, high buildings called Plattenbau where I grew up. Where a lot of kids. Were, uh, were playing on the streets every day, so streets football was beside the organized football in 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 the clubs was part of my daily routine, and uh, so that's why I picked up a lot from the street as well. What what were you like as a kid? When I grew up, I of course I was I was really competitive. You know, I wanted to I want always to be the best. Uh, but the expectations were always, uh, even at a young age, were really high. So they they measure you uh, and depending on your talent. And so was the communication between coaches, between my parents, between my friends. 
And um, yeah, I have I had targets even at a young age. I want to be become a football player, of course, but I, at the same time, I knew how difficult it was because when you play with older kids, uh, you realize really quick the, the physical difference and which you have to which you have to adapt. So there was always something where I had concerns, um, but when you grow up and you become uh, you're going to the age of 16, 17, 18, when uh, the big step is, is coming up to, to join the professional football, um, then obviously you realize how difficult it is. And, and, and then you, you have to have something what you can't learn, which is passion, which is uh, competitiveness, uh, competitiveness in, in, uh, in a certain level where nobody can teach you. You mentioned street football, and I've spoken to... Um, people like Paolo de Cameo, who talked about street football themselves, and it seems to have produced. And the Brazilians play beach football. It's, I mean, what for you? Did you prefer street football to organised football, and did it give you something different? Because you were you were a very talented and very technically gifted player, and some of the other players that I've spoken to, like de Cameo, different temperaments, different achievement levels, but again, still technically very gifted. Do you think street football gives you that, and did you enjoy that more? initially than the organized structure of football. Absolutely. Um, you described it really well because even at a very high age, now you see guys, football players, professional players, they are retired. They love street fo football. They love the football 5v5 still with amateurs, you know, because it's fun. There's no rules. It's different rules. And the streets, street teaches you something which you cannot learn. You know, there is no rules on the street. There is major rules of course there's goals there's part of the games but there's no coach who's uh, dealing with problems because you have to deal with the problems under each other you know there's a a certain hierarchy on the street and uh, that was really really important and uh, a major part in my career I remember I was very very small at the age of four or five when I start to go on the street alone and want to play with the big guys on the street and I had to wait they didn't let me play with them because I was too small so I had to wait one day two days three days until they were too less you know for a game and they starting to invite me and so step by step this is really something uh, in a natural process when you describe that what what is important uh, also on a high level because when we talk about education in these days and all these uh, education schools where everything is organized, everything is prepared for the young kids, for the talented kids. Yeah, yeah. But uh, sometimes I think it's it's not too easy, but it's a bit too much. Too comfortable. Uh, and they have too comfortable. Yes, and they have something too early, you know? Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, yeah. A level on comfort and everything where they have access to next to their talent. It doesn't mean they're not competitive or they're not motivated but there is a certain level of uncomfortness where which which you yeah. need to to be successful on a very high level later i mean i i agree that young players these days are given too much too early and too much comfort and i don't think it builds character and one of the things that we've got a lacking of it would seem at times is a lack of character in your in your judgment in your experience how useful do you think is adversity and an ability to overcome it in building the character of a top footballer i think it's really difficult to 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 do that in an artificial environment and artificial i mean you're going to school you go what i described when i when i went to a sports school it was a full day job for me, I'm telling as, as a job because it was an edu already a high level education for me, even at a very young age. But additionally, I went home and I went to the streets. I took this two, three hours streets football. Additionally, 5 p.m., 6 p.m. after my school right. day. And, and that's something what I mean, it's you cannot learn it. That this is not a prepared environment, which we have in these days for the young kids. A full day, let's talk, let's call it full day job, full day education in school combined with training. But you need that well, best case street street friends, street life, yeah. which which teaches you things you cannot learn. They are not prepared mm -hmm. for you. They are not made for you. Yeah. And this is something which is uh, um, yeah unpredictable in your head because you don't know what you expect. 
you don't know who you will meet on the street you don't know what happened on the street so this is this is kind of challenging this is kind of necessary i think for every human well, being it's character building isn't it yeah and 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 um i repeat myself then if everything is prepared you know what you do tomorrow you know your schedule you know what you eat you know everything is predictable and so this is your brain is less used you know because right. somebody made your schedule for you so that's why on a for on an on artificial wise it's it's good to to go on the street and to play mm. and don't know what yeah, you I expect get, i get the gist i'm gonna i'm gonna move you on now to the beginning of when your career starts i'm gonna you know i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna move past shimanitsu which is your first club and move into uh kaiserslautern and you join Kaiserslautern at a remarkable time as part of a remarkable story. I would liken it to, in modern times, the successes of Leicester. In my generation, because I'm a little bit older than you, I would look at it as something like Nottingham Forest coming up from the second tier of English football, then winning the league. You join Kaiserslautern in the first season, they win the Bundesliga. That's a remarkable story, isn't it? Yeah, it's something what... What's what never happened again in Germany, and uh, um, yeah, this was something really unique, really special. Uh, nobody could expect that. Nobody thought about that. Even not me when I decided to to join the Bundesliga, to uh, to join a club where I have a high probability to play. You know, yeah. I want time on the pitch, and where you can have time on the pitch as a young player, maybe there's there's a club who. Who, who went up, you know, in the first division. But, yeah, How I had a... You then? How old were you then? 1920? Yes, yes. And, yeah. um, but I, I I became a coach with Otto Rehagel, who actually uh, preferred experienced player at this, mm -hmm. at this time. And, uh, of course, we were from the day one, we were really successful. We beat Bayern Munich, I remember that, away 1-0. And uh, from there we had a run, you know, we were leading the, the table for, for a long time and, and we had a really experienced team combined with very young, talented players. But I needed time, you know, it was not immediately that I was part of the first team, I was on the squad, I was on the bench. Yeah, I think you I, played I 16 games that season, didn't you? I played 16, but the first six months, just three. So right. the first, first half, it was, I, I, I need patience again, like I was very young. And I was really frustrated because as a young player, you don't have patience, even if the coach tells you, you know. But on the other side, we were successful. We were winning. And that mm -hmm. keeps your mind up. That keeps accepting that even as a young player. Because when you're leading the, uh, the, the Bundesliga and you have this big target. And, and obviously, it came like it came. We won the league. It was unbelievable. My first year in the Bundesliga straightaway champion, it was something really special. You then you're there for a couple of years. I mean, the second season, Kaiser Slatten, um, you know, I, fin I think finished fifth, and you then move across to buy and Leverkusen. And now, of course, Leverkusen is an interesting story at this moment in time in both German football for a variety of reasons because they look like they're going to break the monopoly that Bayern Munich have had for the last eleven years. I want to understand a little bit about Leverkusen because obviously in in England we are aware of Leverkusen, we know about some of their achievements, but a lot of it is very Bayern Munich focused. So I want to get a sort of the sense and scale of, of Leverkusen that you join, which actually goes on to do some remarkable things, which we'll talk about in a minute, but also the Leverkusen and the achievements of today and what they're doing now in the context of German football. Yeah, for me, for me in these days, uh, it was the next step. Even if we were champion and we finished fifth, uh, Bayer Leverkusen was above Kaiserslautern because mm. it was a, a very high rated club, good education for young players for the next step, but uh, with, combined with a lot of international South American top players, young top players, especially Brazilians, they had a very good scouting system in, in South America uh, and, and so that's why uh, a small, small uh, stadium I think 22 or 28 maximum thousand in these days, modern stadium, um, small town. Um, so it was a good place for me to make the next step to del deliver, uh, to develop my, my game on a, on a high level. And uh, I was very pleased to, to get this offer 
to to play at this club where I had a great time and uh, played with great players uh, next to me. Uh, went to the Champions League final. Um, but as you as you know, we, we didn't won a lot of titles. Even in these three days, I joined Bayer Leverkusen from 2000 to 2002. Uh, we were runners-up three times. We finished second um, twice in the Bundesliga, leading the, the league until the last mm. match twice. So it was really frustrating for me. It was on one hand, it was a great, great time and over over nearly a year. But the last week, it was o always really disappointed uh, in terms well, of gonna, not winning the you, league. And I was going to ask you about that because obviously in, in 2000, um, but Leverkusen have a, a, an opportunity to win the league and they don't. They draw the last game of the season, which they needed to, not, to, to, to win to be able to win the league. In 2001, 2002, a team... Um, that could have done the treble falls at each hurdle from the German Cup through to the Champions League um, uh, and through to the Bundesliga. And it kind of, I believe, got given the nickname Neverkausen rather than Leverkausen in terms of winning things. Vizekusen. Oh, okay. Weisskusen. Weiss Weisskusen. Okay. Well, my, Eng English. my English translated it as never, ne never Kausen because it didn't win anything. No. But yeah, in, Eng in English football, what would get thrown at people is bottling i.e the team didn't have the mental character to win that and and that could be levied at its players when when something like that gets thrown around because they've just thrown it recently at Chelsea they've called I think Gary Neville called Chelsea a bunch of bottlers and last season with Arsenal being on top of the Premier League and not being able to close out the deal they were called bottlers is there not an accusation that could be thrown at the Leverkusen side and you as one of its players that to have been in those situations and to have walked away with nothing, that there could be an observation that you guys bottled it. <laughs> uh, at these days, um, it was frustrating, like I described, but um, they break this now. I'm pretty sure now it's the time where they will win the league. Um, and of course, with Xavi Alonso. Uh, no, you're not going to get away with that. I'm not talking about what they're going to do now. <laughs> I'm talking about you and your team in 2001 and 2002. Yeah, we were we were we were called uh, Vizekusen, and um, um, but we we deserved it, you know, because uh, we had the chance to win it, and it was our fault to to miss that chance because it was not uh, that we, yeah, that somebody else' fault it was. We missed it. We had this opportunity, um, especially winning the league. That was the biggest target, winning the league, and um, I, I was part of that team. Uh, so as and a few other big, big players, they went, they left the club and uh, they said this, um, but... Um, what do you put it down to? I mean, to, to, no, lose no, one, to lose one is a disappointment. To lose two is beginning to yeah. become a disaster. To lose three, there seems to be a, a consistency here. I mean, is it was it a mental attitude? Was it a mental failure? What was it that enables you to lose three you can, out of you, three? I, I cannot find a, the right word. It's not a mental failure, but it has to... Has, to do, uh, 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 it has to do something with mentality, of course, with with a mental issue that was in the club, and and we were not able to to go over this step to win it and to break that. Um, but I cannot tell you what it was because as a player, you play thirty games, you play thirty one, you play thirty two, thirty three successfully. And then it's this last match, and 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 you lose that. Uh, we could lose an earlier game, which puts you, which don't even put put us in this position. Mm. But uh, there's no excuse in these days, and uh, we were, <clears throat> or this this Leverkusen uh, in these days, in these years, 2000 until 2002 was one of the best teams they ever had, and uh, this was it was on us, and and. Anyway, we accepted that, and after how, that, how how did you respond to it? Because in the same year, you have a situation with the German national side, where in two thousand and two, I think you get sent off in the semi-finals. The Germans lose the final, so now you've not got three, Michael mm -hmm. Ballack, You've got four. Mm -hmm. So how was that for you mentally to look at the fact you've been part of a brilliant side that won nothing, and a German side that ultimately loses a, a, a World Cup final. How was that for you? How did you respond to that as a person? 
then my character helped me because yeah. I'm my 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 first is I I I changed the club. I moved clubs, which helped me. Yeah, I moved to Bayer Leverkusen 2002, which helped me a new environment, new players, new Bayern people Munich. around yeah. me. Bayern Munich, sorry to forget that uh, experience. And also my character, uh, I was always a player or a human being who accept, who can accept things, you know, or don't really think too much about think what happened and why don't it happened. It. No, because you cannot change it. So change it when you have the time or the possibility to change it, which means in that game on the pitch, but what happened, happened. And so, I don't know, the mental coach or something, that was kind of a strength where I can move forward. I can leave things. Yeah, I can leave things behind me, yeah. and, and I can I could accept things, and that's really uh, important, especially in sport, in failure when you miss matches, when you lose a match, and when you lose important matches even more. Um, so that was really is that important. Winner's, is because, that a winner's mentality, Michael? The ability to accept something's gone and I, then try and impu- improve the future. I mean. You have to start earlier. If I mean, I won a lot as a young kid. You know, I won championships as a young kid. But for me, in that age, maybe 14, 15, that was really important. But compared to my career, you yeah, know, when you become a professional player, it's, it's, it seems like not important. But for me, as a human being, it was as much as important as winning the league with Kaiserslautern or with Chelsea mm-hmm. or with Bayern Munich. But... In a public way, in a public, they judge you differently. They judge you on your missing, what you miss, and what you lose, and then you become an image. But uh, I repeat myself: it's important that you have the men- mental strength and your own ability to being focused on your strength. And losing is part of winning, and is part of 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 of, of every career of life. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And and you have to accept things, and you have to become stronger at that. And uh, but of course uh, there was some big matches I lost and uh, um, I repeat myself uh, I had the mental strength and the ability to leave that behind me to be uh, and move uh, on to, to the next challenge and yeah. move on uh, exactly I want I want to take you back to Leverkusen for a second um, but I want to bring it up to date because the rise of Leverkusen now again um, and their current performances I mean in German football we look at it and we watch. Bayern Munich dominate the Bundesliga, and I'll have I'll have some questions about the Bundesliga in a minute. But we watched them dominate. Okay, they got away with one last year with Dortmund choking on the last game. Um, but how big a deal for German football, and how big of achievement will it be for Leverkusen to achieve what it looks like they're about to achieve? It's huge. It would be huge. It's good for the league. It's good for Leverkusen anyway. But it's also good for the league, and it's also good for Bayern Munich because it they have up. to. Exactly, they have to questioning themselves, which they should last year. But as you just as you mentioned, uh, they were lucky, and of course, if you're winning, you don't really put the finger into the the wound and and question, questioning enough yourself, which they maybe should. Um, they burned two big coaches in the last in one year mm-hmm. with Nagelsmann, and now with Tuch- uh, Tuchel. Tuchel. Yeah. So they have to questioning themselves in in a lot of ways, you know. But coming back to Leverkusen, it's a fantastic job they did since uh, Xavi Alonso uh, took over, you know, uh, uh, last year. He did a, a great job. Uh, they they signed great players which fit the team, the current team, perfectly. And um, yeah, that's that's. That's a can competition I, I, the I, league can, needed. Can I just ask you a question on the observation that you made about it's good for the league? Because the perception is, and it's a it's a perception that, that, that I have and lots of other people that aren't part of the German football league, is that you've got a league that's dominated by one side uh, in Bayern Munich. So by Levenkausen winning the league, does that, that, does that do the Bundesliga uh, a good service? breaking up the monopoly of Bayern Munich. Is that what you meant when you, when you said it was good for German football? That's what I mean. Of course, if, if always the same team is winning, <laughs> there's a prediction, <laughs> of course. There's a probability to win again and again and again. And I don't. Uh, we want competition, you know. As a fan or the fans want competition. They want exciting games. 
they don't want to know who's winning at the end of yeah. the of the season. Uh, this is, has nothing to do with Germany or with England or with Spain. It's, it's everywhere is the same. You want competition, natural competition, you know. And uh, if one team is dominating a league like Bayern Munich did the last years, of course, you lose it the gets competition a, and the and it's the get intrigue. a bit boring. Yeah. And and, yeah. and you want that. And that's why I think. And I mean, it's good for the league, you know. And it's also a, a sign on all, all the other teams. You can do it. You can beat Bayern Munich. You can do a good job. Uh, uh, when you do a good job, you uh, you, you get, get outcomes. Your, uh, you, exactly. Yeah. What do you think of the? Where are you on the the uniqueness of your league's construct? I'm going to come back to Xabi Alonso in a minute at Leverkusen, but I just want to pick up on the object of of the observation you made about the German league and it being good for football in Germany, but also the 50 plus one rule, because obviously in England with the Premier League, you've got this unique financial powerhouse with huge investments coming in from all over the world. And it's very different in Germany. I've noted, I saw recently the resistance to media rights being bought and sold to commercial businesses and the German fans having a very strong reaction to that. And the 50 plus one rule to my mind as a former owner makes ownership Quite a difficult thing in Germany. Where are you on that rule? What do you think it does for German football? Do you think it's good because it indexes the fans to the club? Or do you think it holds back the development of German leagues economically and literally? It's a, it's a very interesting question. And we, we, we talked about this question uh, a lot. And there's, of course, different views on, on that structure. And uh, to be... but. Thinking international-wise, and when we talk about Champions League, international competition, we want to be competitive uh, with our best clubs as well. And that's why it's, it becomes um, difficult, more difficult when, when we talk about investments. And money talks, that's, yep. that's not a secret. And there where the most money is, obviously the best players play, you know. And um, that's why they're doing a good job. But um, of course, investment-wise, it's 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 not as interesting as, uh, for, for example, in the Premier League for for investors. But when we talk about sport, about football, we don't we we don't have to forget the fans. You know why is football so popular? It's it's about the fans. It's of about course. the passionate and yeah. the whole environment, which is the players, the fans, everything around football. And you, you, you don't have to forget that, that this is a but do you voice. Not think it's a bit, and, do you not think it's a bit out? I mean, I, I hear you and I get you and I agree with you that the lifeblood, the heartbeat, the emotional reaction from fans, we saw it during COVID, empty grounds. And um, we also saw it at the Super League, you know, when when true. we talked about the Super League. And, and, and uh, even even the English fans had a, had a big voice in that. And They did. And there but were do you, protests. Do, do you think in your league, Michael, that the model of 50 plus one is possibly a little bit outdated. And the reason why I say it, because obviously societally Germany is different and it has a different view. Otherwise, this would never have been thrown up in the first place. But when you've got these powerhouses like the Premier League that are generating more and more money, and now you've got Man City with Middle Eastern ownership now looking like it's going to dominate English football and is beginning to dominate it and, pr and produce predictable out outcomes that you're used to. And the, and the Champions League is beginning to look like uh, City could dominate that too. Do you not worry that the 50 plus one rule makes the German opportunity outdated and a little bit inflexible given what it's competing against? Of course, it is. It is, but um, the system has to work and the fans are still part of that system and you have to talk to the fans and, and to, the structure, yeah. to the structure that they accept it. You have to take the fans... They have to have a voice in that decision. I'm, I'm, I'm actually not a fan of, of 50 plus one. You know, no. uh, to being competitive, uh, I, I, I love football, but I love also competitiveness, and I love high level football in a very professional way because I, 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 I played on that level uh, and I took advantage of that level. Mm -hmm. You, you, you mentioned my my history from East Germany. It would never be possible if this political. Uh, history wouldn't happen. I, I wouldn't have this opportunity to play on a high, high level and yeah. to, to compete and to measure myself with the best in the world. And 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 it's a bit with the, with that as well. If we if we don't adapt in Germany, if we don't adapt to that uh, international, uh, you're going to get left behind. Probably, but yeah. a, 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 until now we found ways on a very high level, not yeah. not just Bayern Munich. 
to come to compete. You have Dortmund, uh, of course. Absolutely. So there there is ways, but I don't know how long these ways are because the other side is developing as well, and and money is is the sport is the, is the generates more and more money, yeah. and uh, we will see what what happen. Can I ask you about Xabi Alonso? In your view, what kind of manager? What kind of manager is he? Yeah, first, he has the natural ac acceptance uh, uh, as a former high, world class player. You know, yeah. you have this 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 respect from the players which you cannot uh, ask for. Uh, uh, if you're a normal coach, you know, because he has this history, he has this uh, like knowledge. Zidane at Madrid, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you're a great coach. But he has to have the character and the speech and the attitude and the personality. So he brings a lot of things combined in a very uh, outbalanced, in, in a very good way uh, that people accept you. But the, the, the most important thing is that the players accept you that you you can build a team a team spirit which he obviously has because if you watch Bayer Leverkusen playing uh, it's not just that they play good football you know it's also the team spirit they have mm -hmm. that he creates uh, in this club because I know the club and I know the former teams over the last years how players behave how they play for their club and and I, I can I can see there's a, there is a difference and and that has something to do with the coach it's when you compare it with Jurgen Klopp when he moved to to Liverpool yeah. how he changed that club that mentality of the club Liverpool always had a, had a great history and and, mm -hmm. and was successful in the recent years but in between they lost something you know they lost a bit of quality they lost a bit of it and a bit of that and if you have coaches because for me it's the most important person in the club is the coach is the manager in England called manager yeah. and uh, because he is he pres he pr uh, represents the club he speaks every day to the press to the players so there's so much things he can change uh, with his voice with his speech with his personality and he brings this uh, winning mentality into the club which what, he obviously do think, brought do you, wait, do you think that's his greatest quality is winning mentality yeah, but, but he achieved everything as a, as a player. So he knows winning. He knows how to the smell is of winning, and uh, but he he has to adapt to the players. Yeah. That's that's the secret for a big coach as well. Even if you were a big player, you cannot combine yourself immediately with the the quality and brings that level of thinking of knowledge of yeah. quality immediately into the into the team. If you can from day one, even better. But I think there has has to be an adaptation, you know, a process, and and you cannot learn it. You learn. Of do you course. think? Do you think it's advantageous for him, Michael? I, I hear what you're saying, which is the adaptability. There was oft, often observations made about great players going into management, watching other players that couldn't do what they could do and having no tolerance of it. I think th people made observations about Glenn Hoddle when he was the England manager that that was a challenge. Do you think one of the benefits of having man managed Lever Kelsen and not having a team littered with world-class players and players that have strong perceptions of themselves has helped him in that situation? Now, obviously, he, cho he, he, chose his, uh, or he chose his uh, clubs really well, really yeah. wise, because... Uh, he, he knows the first thing you have to accept when you were a big player, that doesn't mean you're automatic, immediately automatically a big coach. So you need to, you need to learn uh, to, to manage a, a team, you know, to work like with players yeah. on the other side. And that's what he did, you know. Uh, and Leverkusen is, is, a, is a perfect, a perfect um, a club for, for that. Uh, having high ambitions, yeah. being being uh, competitive on a high, high level, but not on the level maybe Bayern Munich or Chelsea or Manchester United. This is even another step because the expectation is immediately on another level. So you need to know that as a coach as well. When you, when you go to Munich, you're at Leverkusen, as you quite rightly pointed out, for three years. But it also... It's one of those unique football clubs, Michael, isn't it? Like Liverpool, like Manchester United, like Barcelona, like Real Madrid, um, like the Milan football clubs. It comes with... And an intense amount of attention and scrutiny. What is what is what is it like to go into one of what I would describe as one of these legacy football clubs where the expectations are so high? What's the sea change for someone coming out of Leverkusen 
bang into Germany's number one football club? Everything, but the important thing is the uh, expectations. You yep. know, you play against expectations. It's not always a joy, you know, to play at that high level clubs because the expectations are so high during 80-90% of the season um, you have to win, you have to win, you have to win the next game again and again and again. Where at smaller clubs there's more joy because there's less expectations, you know, there's more relaxation in, 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 in your body because if the pressure is more high, uh, that doesn't mean you enjoy it more. I mean, you're more used to it and it's challenging and I did the challenge because I know what I expect and I can handle it. That's why it's so important to, to do it at the right moment in your life. You have to be prepared for that step. You don't have to be blind what, and, and you have to be surprised if you lose one or two games and then it, it's a, it's a to totally different feedback in the media and everything because it's, it's more expectations. And uh, yeah. Of course, Are you, you surprised by it, Michael? Because again, I, I, you know, just to make comparisons that the the British audience can relate to, there's so many people that equate the challenges that say Man United are having to being the weight of the Man United shirt and certain players, and it takes a certain mindset and a certain character to be able to stand up to the intense scrutiny and expectation. More people talk about a Man United loss sometimes and they do talk about a Man City win. And I would imagine it's similar in Germany. More people talk about a Bayern Munich loss and they might talk on a lesser side's win and lesser side's achievements. I mean, how difficult and, and how surprising and how challenging if it was you. You've got a strong mentality. You've already indicated that about the things you've overcome and the journey that you've been on, the decisions that you make. But walking into this club, were you surprised um, uh, by the level of scrutiny and the, by the level of expectation and by the level of responsibility that you had being a Bayern Munich player? No, I was not surprised. I was, I was not surprised. I think I was in a, in, a, in a good age where I made the move. I, I didn't know what it means, you know, to being in that position, to being in the dressing room, uh, to feel the pressure by the media, to feel the pressure by the own bosses you know and day in day out nearly every day but I was prepared I was uh, mentally prepared I had my experience in making in other clubs uh, the, um, I progressed also um, in terms of choosing clubs you know Kaiserslautern Leverkusen and then Bayern yep. Munich so that, that helped me you know and my my past helped me as well to be prepared for that level of football mental expectation and pressure of football and and i know there was um, other players next to me they couldn't handle that yeah so well which is not a weakness but it is like it is because the mental part in sport it's it's much bigger than you think i mean you know it's big but yeah it's huge it's huge why is a player performing under one coach good and under the next one not so good it's it's the same club. It's the same environment. It's just a different speech. If you com if you're confident enough in your own ability, nothing should should affect you. But it affects you. Things around us affect us. It's it's uh, something where you have to pay attention. And, and and that's a in these days there's a big level of improvement and also on on high profile sportless professional sports men's. Uh, to be prepared for certain uh, challenges. And uh, I was prepared, uh, but I also still had ups and downs. That's normal in sport. And uh, yeah, but but I love challenges and, and that's why, yeah, I, I made that move. <laughs> you, um, you, you obviously had success in Bayern. Uh, you win a series of Bundesliga titles. You win German Cups, but you don't win the European Cup and obviously elite German teams are set up to win European Cups like any of the other elite teams. How much of a disappointment for you was that? Uh, to be honest, we, we didn't have that team which they had after, my, uh, after I left the club, you know, where they started to, to invest more and more in big players. Um, that doesn't mean we had a bad team. We, we had a a good team to win the league, but never really to say at the beginning of the season 
we can win the Champions League. We, we didn't have that team um, on an international um, comparison. But it was still disappointing because I moved to Bayern Munich. I, I had also the opportunity to go to Real Madrid at these days, 2002. I remember that, but I wanted to, to join the biggest German club. Also knowing we're having the World Cup ahead in 2006. Um, but um, it was a disappointment. But that's why also I changed after four years to another club. To go to Chelsea. Absolutely. Any, any regrets about not going to Madrid? Normally, no, normally the, no. when Madrid come calling, people go running. Uh -huh. Yeah, but for me, Bayern Munich also, and, and I, have to, I have to admit, uh, Uli Hoeneß played a big part in that, in that uh, negotiation and in that... Uh, to convince me, you know, to convince me to join Bayern Munich. Uh, if if you once you go to to the office to Uli Hoeneß um, and Karl Heinz Rummenigge, it's it's something which they can catch you. You know, they can mm. emotionally catch you. Uh, and I was, o o of course, I was a, a German player, ha having al always the dream also joining Bayern Munich. So there mm. was. Ups and, da ups and downs for, for each club. So in the end, uh, it was a decision. I was really luck in a lucky position because I had a fantastic year, 2002, uh, maybe one of my best years ever in, in my, my career. And then having the opportunity to join big clubs, it was, was a pleasure. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you've turned that into a positive because 2002... You lost. You lost three final. You lost three <laughs> opportunities and lost the World Cup. But I hear what you're, you're saying. You always pick something negative. You see, no, I'm not. How, I'm just you, holding the you perspective to could I'm not be different. Something negative. No, no. It, it, you're right. I want to. Ask, I want to ask you about the decision that you made in 2006. From from my understanding, there wasn't just Chelsea in for you or potentially interested in you. There were again Manchester United potentially, Real Madrid again, and Inter Milan. All of these clubs, arguably could be considered and subsequently did win European competitions. Um, what made you choose Chelsea? Why did you choose Chelsea? I mean, as you know, I had a family too. Family always really important for me. To live in a good city was also part f of my decision at these days. So London was for me a great city and, and to have the opportunity to live in that city combined playing for one of the biggest clubs, uh, being really, really competitive in, in winning the Champions League. That was something what, what I felt they really wanted and they were willing to invest more and more. And my confidence was high to, to play it uh, with 29. I mean, I was in a very good age, but it was also something uh, when I do this move, everything has to be right. And that's why I waited. Well, it's, your big, uh, it's probably your last big move, isn't it? Yes, and, and and that's why I choose Chelsea. But if I can also, there were arguments for other clubs, of course. But I cannot say yes or no. I just have to, choose, I, I just can choose one club. You no, know? fair enough, understood. <laughs> but obviously it's always interesting to understand why someone chose people. Some people might say, well, the economics of Chelsea would have been very attractive because Roman Abramovich's investment and prepared they to were, pay. They were, they were. They were good. They I'm were also you... attractive, right. yes. And fair play, absolutely, yes. why not? But what was another part of it, someone that I have a great deal of admiration for and think often gets misrepresented, is um, Jose Mourinho. How, how, how big a deal in the decision-making process was the ability and the opportunity to play for Mourinho? Big. Why? Big, uh, yeah, because... Uh... Like I described the move to Bayern Munich in terms of Uli Hoeneß, what he means, what it means to talk to someone like, what, like this, was, uh, that was the same, to talk to Jose. And uh, he could catch you, you know, he could uh, give you arguments. He d it doesn't need an hour. It doesn't need an hour. It, it, it takes 10 minutes, 20 minutes maximum. And then, it's a, and then you feel it, you know, you feel you feel the ambition, you feel the, the desire uh, to win something and you feel, the, you feel the belie that he believes in you. You know, that's the most important thing for a player. When I talk to a coach, uh, of course, you, you negotiate a contract with the board. Yep. You don't do it with the manager. But yep. the, when you want to play for a club, you have to talk to the manager and what role he, he, he sees in you, what he expects from you. Well, um, you feel immediately the, the chemistry or you don't feel anything, you know, and which is also part of your decision. It's the, 
the, the biggest part of your decision is to talk to the coach. And Jose is a is a is a is a great great coach, great motivator, and that's why, of course, there was there was no doubt in that. As I said, and and again, it comes from a position of not trying to find weakness because I'm a huge Mourinho acolyte. I look at him now and in the past. Uh, when my team got promoted to the Premier League, I had the misfortune of playing Mourinho's team, his new team, within two games. And we got our heads handed to us. I admired him. I admired the way that he dealt with the press. I loved the fact that he did a press conference with telling people what he was going to do and then went and did it. What kind of, you know, what people don't get and understand about Mourinho and only people that have played for him can really speak about is what kind of style of management he exhibited over players such as yourself. I've heard Lampard talk about him. I've heard John Terry talk about him. They'll have nothing but good things said about him. But I'm interested to see what your what you felt his greatest attributes were, what kind of style of manager he was in terms of did he put his arm around your shoulder, did he kick you up the backside, was he multifaceted? What kind of management style did just, just Jose Mourinho exhibit beyond what people see in press conferences and their perception of the teams that he produces? I mean, his, his biggest strength, obviously, is, is, is the speech and the motivation that brings the team together. You want to... You want to die for him. He's our leader. I mean, there was a big personality in the dressing room already, but with him as a as our leader, as our coach, uh, there was a different level of leading and of showing confidence on a prof professional way. But of course, he had also his techniques, how to handle a big squad and how to get out the best out of a big squad. And as as you out of you as an individual i think there's two ways on a on a way how to how to train a team one one way is to to do it in a in a harmony way you know to to create a harmony into the team which is a very close relationship between coaches and players i learned that from the past i had this with few managers and 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 there's a way An, another way of a little bit of more distance, you know, I want, I, I wouldn't say fee, create a fear, but create a pressure, a delivery pressure where you naturally, as a player, naturally, you want to deliver but, and you feel the pressure, but you, it's not overwhelming you, you know, that means that it's not blocking you, you yeah. cannot get the best out of you, that's the secret on a great coach to to get this out of a player in a natural way that that you feel that pressure and that little bit of fear and not performing but you can deliver it because he has also the relaxing part and the and the human being part that you can deliver it on the right time that's the secret i cannot describe you how he does it he has it you know and so uh, what you're saying is he has it both he has the ability exactly. to create a culture of fear and awareness he, and he, consciousness, he, but he also he, can make sure that people are comfortable and they can relate yes. and they can. But feel you cannot feel you cannot feel always comfortable. That what's what's what I'm trying to describe. Yeah, he knows exactly how to step back, how to create the distance between himself and the player. That you feel, oh, oh, it's it's time to deliver. It's it's not. We are not in a comfort zone. We're, uh, I'm in the delivery uh, delivery zone, and that he could, he had always the right distance to the player some sometimes it, it needed uh, that very to be very close but sometimes he, he didn't spoke to you for a week could happen but you, you you're not questioning that you know you're not feeling oh what happened but you felt something mm, okay i understand the message and that's something what great coaches have and uh, he had that and and he had always also the, the the perfect preparation in terms of 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 training analyzing the opponents but also preparing our team in training i was always at the right fitness level on on the weekend so that was never doing uh, um, uh, where well, well, we had trained too less or too too much there was always it was always on the point and uh, it was I mean great How did he get, I mean, can you give me a sort of specific example of how he reached you and motivated you? Because obviously you've come, all you've known, you've played international football, you've played European football, but ostensibly your background has been German domestic football. That's your 
that's the bulk of your experience. You've come into English football with different, a different style of football, uh, arguably more physical uh, and, and a faster pace. But Mourinho has to manage you and get the very best from you and get the very best from a world-class Michael Ballack. What, 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 what did he do with you that you can recall for the purpose of this conversation that specifically motivated you, that got you thinking, like you said a moment ago, um, you wanted to die for him? What what did he do with you that made you feel that way? First, I have to say I have to I have to have a high level of self motivation as yep. a high profile player. Yep. If I go to a club and I needed to be motivated by a coach, it's wrong. But of course, there is always uh, moments in your career or during a season where you're struggling, where you're not performing well, where you have a bad game, and that's about the coach to read you, to read everyone in the squad and and to to balance that, you know, to to know what's good for the team and to keep the, the, the competition up in between the players. And what he always was trying to do to, to create a great confidence in the team, but also for yourself. And connecting. Yeah. Do were you were you a bit shocked and surprised um, when he gets fired? Literally 15, 16, one of the big decisions that you made alongside the fact that it was economically worth your while, which is all part and parcel of business. That's the life we all lead in. Everyone wants to make more money. But but Mourinho goes. That must have been a bit of a disappointment and a bit of a, a, a you know, a bit of a surprise and shock for you. Um, we didn't play well. We didn't play well at these days. At that time, we didn't have the right results. So it was a question of time when, when, the, when the club reacts. And obviously, the managers, the... The weakest position uh, in a in a football team, and uh, but it hurts us. It hurts us uh, and a lot of players. You know, even players that are not maybe playing in the first team. Uh, in the first team, I mean, which means in first eleven. Uh, that that shows how respected he was and how accepted he was. And and of course, with winning the league twice. Um, and uh, what he means for, to the Chelsea fans, it mm -hmm. was also a very big disappointment for, for everyone, especially for us as a, as a player. Do you recognize the, the Mourinho of today in relation to the Mourinho you, you played for? I mean, obviously, since then, he's gone on to Milan, to Madrid, to Manchester United, to Tottenham, and now to Roma. And I, I dislike the way the media seem to portray him as a dark character, as somebody that brings division and controversy and and aggravation, the battles that he potentially had with Pogba, some of the behaviour of the Roma team, um, some of his attitude at Milan. I, I just look at that as a high-level manager operating in a certain way. But do you recognise the manager that you played for in 2006 to the current Jose Mourinho, where people are saying, you know, it's all over. He's not a top class manager anymore. And he's also not exhibiting the sort of forward thinking that he was once famed for. It's sport. So simple as that. Uh, he trained the biggest teams, or some of the biggest teams in the world, and he was yep. successful. He proved he's a big coach. Uh, he proved everything. But in sport, you have to prove every time, time. Yeah. Oh, again and again and again. And of course, over time, it gets more and more complicated and difficult to achieve that at every club. It cannot work because every club is different. The players are different. The mentality of the clubs are different. And sometimes things are not working. They're just not working. There's not always an explanation. And that makes something with yourself, mm. uh, especially with a character like he is, you mm. know, if he couldn't handle it, he would not always look for a new challenge. I think that's what he likes, that's what he loved, to being manager and to have this in a daily work. That, that's him, that's him. And of course, people see him controversial and, and sometimes it's his fault as well with certain quotes. But he does this sometimes also on purpose. I don't have to describe him now. You, everyone knows him. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's sport. I want to, I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw a curveball at you and move you on to your national side, and I'm going, to, I'm going to throw it under the moniker of what's happened to the Germans, because we're now seeing a German a team over recent seasons, over recent tournaments, sorry, that isn't really 
in my lifetime, with a few exceptions, um, reflective of German international football. W what's happening to the German team? <laughs> It's not so easy to to explain. We 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 lost something. We lost something, uh, or we lost especially something. What was I think one of our biggest strengths, which is competitiveness and 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 discipline, and and the willing to to win games. Doesn't matter how. We were not always the best team playing the best football technically, uh, but we had this certain mentality combined with technique, with organization, with discipline, which we stayed for. And we lost that a bit, you know. We, we, we look too much to other teams, maybe to teams who, who played better football, where we also want to change our style of play, but it doesn't work. It, it, it just doesn't work to be successful. We have still very good players That, that you see that where the, where the players play and which club they playing international wise on a high high on the best clubs in the world. Um, but as a team, you know when they come to the national team, they cannot show that um, as, as a team over the last six or eight years. So yeah, we lost that a bit. We have to go we have to come back to that. We have to understand that first, we have to accept that and we have to change that. Do you think it was always a very difficult task? for the national side to replace Joachim Lowe? There's always a time where, where it's over, you know, and uh, he had this big achievement where the Federation said, okay, we, we, we don't fire him, you know, we give him another opportunity and another opportunity, but things doesn't went in the right direction, you know, but that it's not his fault or somebody else's fault, it's what I'm talking about, it's the mentality of a, of a whole nation, you know. And now, well, what's been lost, Michael? I mean, you, 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 like you just said, you've got players. We changed the education as well. We changed the whole, the, the whole speech. You know, it's not just in football. It's a generation problem. The way we talk to each other, the way we talk in high professional football. I don't know if we become too soft, but we accept it or we, we, we changed that into a way where we lost strength. And, and that starts in the youth. That starts with education. That's, that starts how coaches, how teachers speak to children in a certain way, in a good way, but in a competitive way, in a, in a healthy, competitive way, which how I grew up, how I knew. But and, isn't and that the same? But we're talking about societal things. We're talking about a change. And, and you're not saying something that I wouldn't suggest is symptomatic of society in England and society in a lot of the West, where we are starting to adapt the way that we, we develop uh, resilience and fortitude and character. So all of these countries are having these challenges in the way that they produce the next generation of people that are going to be successful. But, but notwithstanding that, to see the Germans, I, I would suggest to you that if you weren't hosting this tournament, you'd have had a bloody difficulty qualifying for it and to see German <laughs> football and I'm trying not to smile to see German football um, struggling this way internationally is a, is a surprise I, I doubt that that we didn't qualify we wouldn't qualify but uh, <laughs> if you see it like that or that bad okay we accept it we take it um, but we still have good players we still have very good players you do but that we don't have the right balance in the team. Yeah, we think just with playing, uh, with technical ability, you can win matches. No, you can't. You need the right balance. And that's where also a coach managing is responsible for that, to choose the right players. And of course, to choose the right 11, which can win games. And, and that was not always the case in the past. I mean, for you, Look, looking at it as a former player, I mean, you played 98 times for your country. You scored 42 goals. You, you, you know, you got to finals, you became runners-up, you got knocked out of semi-final stages. But Germany was always in the business end of a tournament. Given that these European championships are in Germany, what is the expectation level? What, are, what, what is expected as a minimum or, 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 or more likely what are people hoping for from Germany in this European championship? 
it's very low, to be honest. At the expectations are not high. The expectations are historically high, but because of the last years, it's it's not really high. We we now we're talking about the color of our away jersey. You know, we 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 having themes um, also at the last World Cup, um, which are not helping the team to be successful, and that's also a part of. Um, of our generation and our uh, society because a, 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 a national team represents society, represents the country, and especially in football, because this is sports number one also in Germany. Mm. And, and uh, it's, it's so the focus on so many details is imp more important than the actual game and the success, being successful on the pitch. And we shouldn't come back to that, how to win games and, and, We need that in a in a way, in a competitive way, and and talking honest, and and yeah, um, then we we become successful again. We we've got a lot of um, talk in the press over in England about this latest generation of English players being another golden generation. It was once referred to back in the day with David Beckham and with Frank Lampard and players like you will know John Terry and Steven Gerrard and players of that ilk, there was a golden generation. Do you, do you think players in the UK or players full stop are built up just a little bit too much and a little bit too quickly? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think you have just the right, the right mixture of, of, of talented players and, and working players, you know, on the pitch. The, you, need, you need players who can make the difference. You have them. No, there's no doubt. But you also have players who can work their socks off, you know, and you need that players. And you have the right balance in the team. Uh, you can, they can play any system. They can play attacking football. They can even play now possession football, which England teams always had problems with. Uh, so you can, you can play any style of football. That means you educated your style of play. You educated your, your young players in different ways and you have the quality of of the players that's that's the secret so simple as that is is the rivalry in between england and germany as meaningful to the germans as it is to the english because i think we almost had a national holiday when we smashed you 5-1 in the team that you played in that was um, in 2001 ago. is it does it does it have the same resonance <laughs> that was to you just guys? a qualifying game doesn't matter it's still 5-1 <laughs> and you had to eat it right but and, But I remember I won the last match at Wembley with, yeah, 1-0. was also yes, a big yes. game for yes, us. Yeah, it, was a, it was a very you bad day for Kevin you, Keegan. You yes, don't you have did. to you forget did. that. You, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, but that's what about three. You got beat 5-1 next time round. But do, It's do, also do, just three points. You know. I know, I know. <laughs> but my question was, there's always this rivalry that's built up between, between England and Germany. And I don't need to look back into the historic reasons why that might exist. But I wondered if it was as prevalent to the Germans. Like we have this rivalry with the Argentinians and when we beat the Argentinians, it means a lot. But when we beat the Germans, it means a hell of a lot. It's all, almost used as a benchmark. Um, you know, you've got to beat the Germans. The Germans always do us in important games and the rivalry that goes with it. Does it, is it, is it a curiosity to you guys in Germany? Do you have the same feeling or you don't? It is, it is, it is a certain way of, of competitiveness but I never felt it so exceptionally right. um, in a way you described it but it's something special it was always something special to play against England of course you know you never want to lose against uh, a game against England this is norm normality <laughs> diplomatic answer Michael Ballack I've really enjoyed it thank you for being so upfront with me thank you upfront with me Simon Jordan is brought to you by William Hill For new weekly shows, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find audio episodes on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly.